Networks can be complicated. They can grow and they can change. Devices can be added and devices can fail. Routing is at the heart of this changing landscape. If it can't adapt to our changes, then our networks will fail. So we need our routing to be as dynamic as possible to keep up with these changes. In this video, we'll see what this means. I hope you enjoyed the labs at the end of the last video. There's another one in this video and some more in the next as well. When you ran through the lab, you probably noticed that it's a pain to configure static routes everywhere. They have their place, of course, but if you're configuring a lot of them, it takes a lot of time, it's prone to mistakes, and they aren't very reactive to changes in the network. So now we're going to look at an alternative, dynamic routing. We can configure one or more dynamic routing protocols on each router, which enables the routers to learn about other routers within the network. Each router will share any route information that it knows with its neighbors, enabling each router to dynamically build their routing tables. There are a few different routing protocol options. Some are more advanced than others, depending on what you're trying to do. We're covering the basics in this video, and in the next, we're going to try configuring routing information protocol, or RIP. So why do we want our routing to be dynamic? So routers can react quickly to changes in the network. Imagine that one of our routers fails. Its neighboring routers will notice that it's dead and will find alternative paths through the network. That is, of course, as long as there is an alternative path to use. Another reason is complexity. Imagine that your network has many routers, maybe 100 or so. Do you want to configure static routing on each one? Do you want to reconfigure them all if something in the network changes? Of course not. Dynamic routing simplifies your configuration. But here's the thought. When dynamic routing is introduced, our routers might be learning routes from a few different sources of information. For example, we might have some routes learned from RIP and some configured as static routes. So how does a router decide how to forward traffic? Well, the same rule still applies before. The router will use its own routing table to make its own decisions. It will build its routing table based on information that its neighbors share, but it won't ask its neighbors what to do. It always makes its own decisions. But what if there are two valid routes in the routing table? Take these examples here, 10, 1, 2, 0, slash 24, and 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 8. Now these are both valid networks, and they are both different networks, so they both appear in the routing table. Now imagine that a packet arrives at this router. Its destination is 10, 1, 2, 1. Can you see how this packet could match both of these routes? So what will our router do in this case? Here is the next rule that you need to know. The router will always use the longest matching route. That is, the route with the most specific subnet mask will be chosen. This is called longest prefix match, or LPM. In this example, the route for 10120 slash 24 is chosen as it has the 24-bit subnet mask. I can't stress enough how important this is to know. If you only take away one thing from this video, longest prefix matching should be your key point. We can occasionally use this rule to our advantage. On this router, we have a route to 10.1.2.0.24 going via 172.16.15.1, which we can prove with a trace route. Now, what if we want to test a different path? We can add in a host route like this one, which has a longer subnet mask. Repeating the trace route shows that traffic is now taking a different path. We've just changed how routing works for one single IP address without affecting the rest. And now let me show you another useful trick. If you ever need to check which route is used for a particular IP, just add the IP to the show IP route command. And you can see from this that dot one is using a different route than dot 22, thanks to the host route we just configured. So here's another question. What happens if the router learns the same route from more than one source? For example, the router may get a route from RIP, OSPF, as well as having a static route configured. Which one goes into the routing table? In a case like this, 
the router uses a value called the administrative distance to decide which routes are used. Every source of routing information, whether RIP, OSPF, static routes, or whatever else, has an administrative distance. There's a few common ones shown here in this table. This is a value that tells the router how believable a particular source of information is. The lower the value, the more the router will trust it. This is important to know, so make sure you understand it. From this table, you can see that a static route is preferred over an OSPF route. OSPF is preferred to RIP, and so on. If a router learns the same route from both OSPF and RIP, and you manually configure the same route as the static route, the router will install the static route into the routing table. If you then remove the static route, the OSPF route would go in its place. Just keep in mind though that other vendors have slightly different names for administrative distance. They also have different values, but the concepts will be the same. Let's bring up a routing table again. You might remember from the last video that I said I'd explain the two numbers in the square brackets later. Well, the first one is the administrative distance. As you can see here, it is set to one. All of this can be a bit tricky, so try these questions to see if it's making sense to you. Some might require that you put in a little extra research on your own, but the time you spend will be well worth it. If we want to, we can manipulate the administrative distance to our advantage. Take a look at the topology again. See how there are two paths between R1 and R5? Let's assume that one is a high speed link and the other is a low speed link. What we would like to do here is use the high speed link under normal conditions. However, if this link fails, we'd like to use the low speed link as a backup. On R5, we already have three routes to the 10.1 networks and they're all using dot one as the next hop. We know that these will be removed from the routing table if the interface goes down. So what we'll do is configure a second set of routes called floating static routes as a backup. This is not much different to a regular static route. We use a different next hop IP, which is on the other link, and we add a different administrative distance to the end of the command, say 20, for example. Our regular routes have an AD of one so they will be added to the routing table under normal circumstances. If that interface goes down, the regular route will be removed, and this route with the higher administrative distance will be added instead. And just to prove it, if I break the primary link now, we can see that the new routes are now in the routing table. We know these are our backups as the administrative distance next to the route is 20, not the usual one. Now I have a, another lab challenge for you to try. The floating static route works from R5 to R1, but if we break the link, R1 does not recover from the error like R5 does. So see if you can fix that issue. And also, if you download the lab from the site, you will find that R3 also has a floating static route that's not working. See if you can figure out why and repair it. And if you're thinking that wasn't anywhere near as much dynamic routing as I expected, then you'll be happy to know that we're really getting into it in the next video. We'll be configuring RIP across the topology, and trust me, there'll be some good labs to play with. See you there.